All right. I have 415. We ready to rock and roll? All right. Sorry. I'm you're going to have to make the mic go up because I'm for you, not for me. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Thank you for joining us uh, for the last presentation between you guys and dinner and pub crawl and woo socks, um, where we're going to talk about fulfillment, which is interlibrary loan software that is a cousin, stepchild, sibling of Evergreen, uses a lot of the same code. Um, so we will start with that. I'm uh, Andrea bunce Diamond. I'm project manager for software development at Equinox Open Library Initiative. And with me, I'm going to just go ahead and just introduce all of you. Why not? Um, I have Jessica Wolford. She is Evergreen Systems Manager at Bibliomation and Bibliomation runs a uh, interlibrary loan consortium called Find It and Request It, which is based on the fulfillment software. Um, also, Mike Rylander, Research and Development Manager at Equinox and um, person most at fault slash responsible for fulfillment development currently, um, by which I mean, thank you, Mike, for helping us keeping to keep making it better. And then Rogan Hamby, um, Data and Project Analyst at Equinox, who does a lot of the um, data work and kind of scripting and um, support side stuff related to fulfillment. And he's got all the social medias. So there you go. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Equinox, uh, in addition to Evergreen and Fulfillment, which we're talking about today, here's a listing of some of the other products that we support and are working on, software development, hosting, support, all that. But that's not what we're talking about today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jessica to start talking about Find It and Request It. All right. So uh, this is a little graphic of the distribution of library networks. This is only public libraries in Connecticut. We have 169 municipalities and you would think maybe it would be easy to get that many towns to agree on what ILS to use and how to do things. No, <laughs> we're Connecticut Yankees. We don't agree on much. Um, so the blue section is Bibliomation, the Bibliomation proper Evergreen Consortium. And uh, then we've got the green is, an, is a IIII consortium called LCI or Library Connection. And yellow is Lion, which also runs IIII. And then we've got a site that has sh a shared Circe instance. And then everybody else is standalone. <laughs> we do have another consortia that's kind of concentrated in the Eastern part of the state uh, that runs autographics, but they're not technically, I guess, a uh, consortium. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, and this is just, like I said, this is just public libraries. This does not count um, the special libraries or the academics that also participated in Find It and Request It. Uh, and Find It and Request It are a joint project between Connect the Connecticut State Library and Bibliomation. All right. Now I hand it over to. Oh, oh sure. I said Andrea or Mike, but you know, do you want to? All right, great. So this is just a little overview of uh, fulfillment. Of course, it's open source since it's you know based on Evergreen, um, fully web based interfaces for patrons, staff, administration. Um, if you obviously, as you're at the Evergreen conference, a lot of those interfaces for administration are going to look pretty familiar to you because they're using the same um, basic ideas there. Uh, there. I mean, a uh, goal of fulfillment is to support resource sharing for physical materials. Right now, we are looking at um, doing expanding into non-returnables in the future, and also to serve as a union catalog um, over several ILS. So the as Jessica was describing, there are Evergreen libraries and Cersei libraries and um, Triple I libraries, all um, under the fulfillment um, fulfillment find it request it umbrella. And then, of course, it uses ever, evergreen sophisticated request modeling and targeting that just as a quick glance at the people in this room, I don't need to explain to you why that's cool. Um, and of course, the same advanced reporting capabilities, um, standards-based connection, as well as custom connectors um, for other ILSs. Now this is you. All right, I'm going to uh, rewind a little bit and just talk about uh, how fulfillment began. Um, it, we came up with the idea for a, um, a super consortium back in 2009. Grand idea. We're going to write some software that will uh, 
let all of the different libraries talk to each other and they don't have to, uh, they, they load the records and everything just works magically. Um, of course, it's 2023 and uh, we don't have that yet, but that was the idea at the beginning. We started development in 2010. Uh, we initially did have connectors for more libraries or more ILSs than we have today, but we uh, significantly refactored the connector infrastructure um, and uh, we've had to recreate uh, the most of the connectors. Um, the first production uh, production size test system um, w was uh, in use in um, 2011 by the original pilot and the pilot testing kicked off um, w and the outcome of that w was fulfillment uh, 1.0 in 2012. And fulfillment is, um, as Andrea alluded to, Evergreen's lazy younger sibling. Um, Evergreen wants to always know where everything is at all times so that it can make sure that it can give the librarians and staff working with the items and the bibs uh, the correct information at all times. Fulfillment can't really do that. So it's kind of just, it's lazy about it. It doesn't need to know where everything is at all times, but that means we have to do some things differently. Um, searching is a little different. Scoping, uh, you can search everywhere and see everything, but when you're doing ILL, you already know you don't have the thing you're looking for. So uh, by default, searching in fulfillment, uh, the scope is inverted. So when you search from your library, you're searching everybody everybody else's stuff, but not your own. Uh, the same is true of, of uh, ILL targeting, um, because you already know you don't have the thing you want. You're going to look everywhere else. Um, the record visibility, like I mentioned, we can't always know where everything is at all times in all, uh, all other ILSs. So the record visibility for search purposes is based on uh, the owner of the record that supplied it, um, as opposed to uh, the status of the item or items attached to it. And uh, you can exclude, this is a slightly slight difference from Evergreen, you can go in and actively, actively exclude specific records for a specific uh, request, ILL request, or for all ILL requests going forward uh, for all time until you say, allow that copy back in. But maybe it's not lazy, maybe it's generous. Uh, the uh, org unit proximity code in Evergreen was originally developed um, for fulfillment. Uh, that was to allow adjustments between networks to say these networks are weighted more heavily than others in relation to their neighbors and things like that. Uh, Evergreen has that now, and there are a couple different iterations of tools that allow you to model your courier networks um, using proximity adjustment now. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The fulfillment uh, ILL management interface that exists to this day was actually the very first Angular JS interface to touch evergreenish code. Um, Bill, that's what I was talking about. <laughs> so <laughs> Bill is, even though Bill um, is an exclusively an evergreen developer, he did write the he did write code that um, uh, became. The or he wrote code for fulfillment that eventually became the forefather of Evergreen's uh, web staff client. And there are other things that fulfillment may be able to share in the future. We are looking at some options that will benefit ILL in particular, but probably would help with things you might want to do in Evergreen, such as multiple fingerprints per per bib record, uh, enhancements to Qt ingest. Qt ingest is great. Fulfillment doesn't have it just yet, but when it does, we'll probably want to be able to do more advanced stuff with the um, Qt ingest because we're ingesting a lot more records in fulfillment than we do in Evergreen. Um, <clears throat> there's a, and this one we can blame on, I mean, credit 
uh, Rogan for uh, the magical record loading infrastructure in fulfillment is um, it's really pretty awesome. And um, I think full, I think evergreen could benefit from at least a subset of, of that. And I know there are other um, magical record loading uh, uh, mechanisms in development and in use as uh, in the evergreen world as well. Uh, but this has a little bit different bent on it. Um, and uh, the aforementioned item level um, targeting exclusion that fulfillment can do could probably be beneficial to evergreen as a way to say, hey, we're not going to lend this item out for now or for that specific request. It's me. And now handing it back to Jessica. So um, this is my cat when she was a kitten uh, and she doesn't really have much to do with fulfillment at all. But, um, you know, she's just kind of here as a representation of the, uh, the early days when we were young and full of hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> That's not a dig. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, just a little bit of a of a history about how things unfolded for uh, Bibliomation, how we got, how we and the State Library got involved in using fulfillment and starting up find it and request it. Um, in 2014, Equinox hold, held a webinar uh, showcasing this new product called fulfillment. Unbeknownst to us, uh, Billy Mission staff attended that webinar, as well as the Connecticut State Librarian, Ken Wigan. And um, in the next, the following year, uh, Ken Wigan, the State Librarian, approached our Executive Director, Carl D'Amelia, to ask if this system was something that he could support, knowing that we already ran Evergreen and that fulfillment was based on Evergreen. He wanted to see if we could support this on a statewide basis. And so he asked that question in March of 2015, and in April 2015, we were able to give to to say, yeah, we can we can try and do that. <laughs> um, and the following year, things kind of kicked off pretty quickly. After that, uh, the following year, we launched the uh, Union Catalog Find at CT, um, which I'll have some statistics on, like how many libraries are loading the records into that later on. And in 2017. We launched the interlibrary loan service, the requested service. Um, they're both branded a little bit differently, uh, a portion of the product. And then the story continues to unfold. Um, this is all sort of development that we have sponsored based on the needs of our members and uh, also um, headquarters staff needs as well. Um, so Andrea will be talking about that later on in the program. Um, and there's a few non-development projects in there too that, uh, that are ongoing. And then uh, going back to my cat, uh, to give the uh, stats slide a little bit more interest, <laughs> um, looking a little bit more mature, hanging out with all the kids' toys. Um, so as of April 1st, 2023, we have 332 libraries commit submitting their holdings to find at CT. Uh, we have 25, over 25 million bib records in the system, uh, 19 million items and copies. So a lot of those records are, you know, e-resources and things like that, government documents. Um, and quite a few page visits to the system. And, uh, you know, it's getting, it's getting a healthy amount of use. And then for the requested program, uh, we have 131 libraries using that uh, portion of it. Uh, 41 libraries of those libraries are Bibliomation members, um, and 18 of them are using the Evergreen Connector. Um, so yeah, probably could be a few more uh, more Bibliomation members using the connector, but we will fault the fact that there was a global event that sort of blocked the adoption of that for a lot of people. And um, there's my cat and her boy, <laughs> he he had uh I had told him the story about how Dora and her family had been found in a car in my parents backyard and he was very charmed by that story and decided to draw her family 
she's not impressed unfortunately i'm like he's <laughs> he's four dora leave him alone <laughs> Um, so here are some more uh, beginning we're all loaded sort of i mean there were scripts and things but we manually kicked off the scripts and we're loading the stuff for the library so we kind of found that like we were like we'll take your loads but we can only manage to do this once a year <laughs> and we did a big push for everybody um and so in order for us to facilitate more frequent loads that's where the auto loading comes in that rogan will be talking about later so that's been a big a big boon for us and now i hand it over to andrea as somebody who used to run IOL for my public library, uh, we could never get anything but aggregate statistics reports from our state um, about lens and borrows. What I really wanted was collection development reports to tell me what was getting uh, borrowed so I could see that and maybe address gaps. Um, and you can absolutely do that in fulfillment because it's got all of the glorious reporting ability that Evergreen has. So sponsor that really together uh, makes this all work really, really seamlessly again with my former uh, ILL staffer hat on. Um, you know, when you get a, an item in fulfillment, you have a barcoded item in your hand, you uh, scan if it's coming in um, for a patron, if it's coming back from a loan, if it's going out to another library to be lent, um, you scan it in exactly one interface and based on the item and location, um, it will tell you what to do next. And there are options, so you don't have to do the thing next, but it will prompt for the next most logical action. It'll focus that so you can sort of one click your way through it if you need to. Um, this is really great in getting me scanning things in the wrong interface. It also uh, allows for flexible request filling. So if you can't put your hand on the exact barcoded item um, that is being that is on your pull list, but you can put you know, your hands on its, its neighbor, another book of the same bib in and fulfillment will automatically pick up that request or put the request on that, um, on that item. And then connectors, uh, which Jessica also alluded to, um, as she mentioned, we, we were launching the connector kind of like in the middle of COVID and libraries obviously had a lot of other things going on, like revamping their entire operations. So we are going to come back to that. Um, but the Evergreen uh, ILS connector is also a Koha ILS connector um, that was released just last month uh, in Fulfillment 11 um, in March, just this past month in March. And then we have been working on a Sierra ILS connector, um, but think it's really hard to work with proprietary software, you guys. Who knew? Um, <laughs> But we are going to try to get that one um, launched as well this year. And better, they're not re um, required. So the connector just alleviates a lot of that double entry that you end up doing with ILL systems. We've got to check it out one place, then check it out another place. Da, da, da. And you do have to do all that double entry and management of things. And the connector just gives a way for fulfillment to talk uh, to your ILS to you know mediate those things. So, that, so here is um screenshot. If this is your whole processing interface right here, that it, that's it. That's the whole thing. That is what you process all of your ILLs in. Ta-da. Um, you scan it. And then obviously if it's, you know, most barcode scanners do scan and enter, and then it'll show you your various options. And the most uh, logical option will be highlighted, will be focused, um, you know, free to proceed. The other tabs that you see here are um, just all kind of pending, are informational tabs. So you can see where stuff is um, in all of those other tabs, or you can check the status of a specific, find it's um, the Find It Connecticut test system. So um, that is what they, they look at right now. And this is, um, 
our slides are going to be shared, so I won't, you know, leave this up there long enough for everyone to read through the whole thing right now, but this is um, sort of my little graphic. Um, but I hope this isn't too too difficult to, to process, but it goes through and shows what the connector workflow, what the points at which the connector, um, which is highlighted in green, steps in and does those workflow bits. So, you know, it's authenticating the patron um, who logs into fulfillment with their ILS username and barcode and fulfillment checks that, authenticates that list. Um, fulfillment goes out and places that request in the only ILS for the book and so on and so forth. So that is um, how it works through that process of um, of making making that workflow smoother again, avoiding that double entry. Like one of my favorite things about um, working on this particular project is that I have a lot of, un and, and um, I like to use those unresolved feelings to help make this better for, for future ILL librarians. So yay. <laughs> All right, and this is just kind of a little summary of what we had to do on the Evergreen side to get this to work. And I honestly can't remember like what we did versus what Equinox ended up at least decided that what we were going to do was create a permission group that had basically the same permissions as our circulation users. And um, we just throw that in our you know little permission group tree. And, uh, and, and then we register the users with that permission group um, and set up those usernames and passwords into the corresponding fulfillment library settings. And that was about it. And um, before the week before the conference, I had an opportunity to chat with a librarian and that works in a bibliomation library, a fairly large urban library two branch system using the connectors. Um, actually, um, fortunately, she was sort of new to it. She had recently taken over as the circulation supervisor and was um, kind of as a other duty as assigned. Um, <clears throat> so she was new to the, the process and she told me, yeah, it took me like 15 minutes to learn it which uh, was, was good feedback to hear. Um, you know, some of the, the feedback, the vacation only goes from fulfillment to Evergreen and not back in the other direction. So if they the item isn't marked to say, hey, this is not a Billy Mation loan and it doesn't get back to her for processing back into fulfillment, there might be some loose ends there. She might get a call or an email from another ILO librarian saying, hey, you didn't complete that transaction in fulfillment and uh, she'll have to go in and, and do it afterward. But, you know, that's... Um, that's um, she also said that she noticed that there's a short delay on the evergreen side to update the status of items. Um, and uh, for loaned items, this is something I just kind of pulled out adjusted to add the last name, which for us is the name of the library um, of the ILL or, or the name of the ILL user account so that that alerts the staff, oh, this is something that needs to be pulled. And so that's what that is. Magic Biblioteca. Okay, magic biblo time. But I'm actually going to start with a tangent because I can't help myself on this one. How many people have seen the big Lebowski? Andrea use uh, the characterization of fulfillment as the lazy uh, sibling to Evergreen. Mike, Mike, okay. I think of it as more like the dude in the uh, big Lebowski. It just kind of abides. It's just okay with wherever the copies happen to be. It's, it's relaxed about it. Not that it's lazy. It's just, you know, it's okay. It'll sort out. Um, so magic bibloting. Have been around a while. We should have publicly uh, available specs on every vendor site about how to grab metadata for records, but we don't. So we need to get holdings information and metadata in the system somehow, and that means we resort back to those good old Mark bibs. Um, easily available everywhere. I suspect I'm going to be retired by then, but <laughs> it's a nice stream. But in the meantime, let's make things work. And that means loading a whole bunch of bib files onto a server and letting them get pulled in and processed just like we do in Evergreen. Now, as Jessica said, 24 million bibs, even with scripts to handle it. Well, what if it's a duplicate file and we've wasted a bunch of time? What if something is bad in the bib load because there was corruption and we discovered that? You know, suddenly it's not just loading 24 million bibs a year. It's so we want to automate that. And that is what fulfillment does for side loading. The records are uploaded via FTP, no patron information. So encryption is not a concern. And we calculate MD5 hashes for them. We could make that something more particular, but MD5 works fine for this. And we log that. So we make sure we're never loading duplicate sets of bibs, which does happen with some automated systems. A pre-processing step where we check them for a number of bibs. We check them for bibs being readable and loadable into Evergreen before we attempt to do it. Sorry, into fulfillment. <laughs> and we check to make sure they're valid. So you can say, okay, well, if there are 70% less bibs in this record than they currently have, don't load it. Something has gone wrong. If X number of percentage of holdings aren't valid, uh, in a system that is accessible for reports because it's in the fulfillment database. And then the status of this work is emailed to an administrator. Probably, I imagine Jessica and Gina are set out to receive these. So how does this all work? Settings, settings, and more settings. 
Org unit settings, we love them, Yaus. And because it's all built on top of Evergreen, we can use ancestor-based settings just like in Evergreen. So you can just set them once for the whole system and not worry about it if you wish. Uh, variations, I'm not gonna go through all of them right now, but if you have experience with things like I likes to not have a distinct field for their location, their actual branch, but adds it as a prefix on their shelving locations, yes, this accounts for that kind of thing. And I already talked about the threshold. So if it's a stock symphony load, you can just put in the org unit settings that it's a symphony library and it just works. But if it is a new source from somewhere, granularity to go in and say, okay, it is the, for some reason they're using the 847, they're using the G for the barcode, they're using a subfield zero for the library name and you can fill all that out in detail if you need to. Now, the future, hopefully gone, and we can actually just use connectors for all this. <laughs> Only Koha and Evergreen will be left. <laughs> be the change you want to see, everybody. All right. So wrapping things up a little bit here, um, I wanted to talk about some uh, additional other recent development that we've have planned here. So uh, most recent major versions, I uh, referred to Fulfillment 11 earlier, which was March 2023, March 2023, i.e. last month. Um, and then Fulfillment 10 was in June 2021. And that's what gave us um, the connector launch that, uh, that the bibliomation libraries are now using. And the, where I say baseline, um, that is the version of Evergreen that is underpinning um, Fulfillment. So uh, as of 3.6, um, all that goodness, as of uh, Fulfillment 11, you've got everything um, from baseline. 310, which includes uh, things like simple reporter and stuff like that. So you can make those available as well. Um, some highlighted development there is on the right, um, single scan, which I showed you earlier, um, 2019. Also with that was um, something that Mike alluded to that might um, be beneficial. What this does is when you uh, scan or you get a copy on your pull list, um, you're looking at your pull list in fulfillment and you're like, you know what, I'm actually not willing to lend that out on ILL, um, this specific copy for whatever reason. You can just say, no, nah, I'm not going to lend that. Um, just this one time, and then the request will go back out um, into the C and find a new copy. Or you can say, you know what, I'm with things like, you know, shelving locations, et cetera. But this lets you do it like with the copy in hand. If you notice that it gets damaged and you don't want to send it out on ILL, you want to send it to damage instead. You can just block that one time. And then the next time it comes back up for a request, you know, that copy will be available. And you can go in and remove that as well. So that's helpful. Um, and there's a couple of different reasons you can pick when you do it. You can say, you know, policy or whatever. And um, those are all configurable as well the various reasons for um, is one of those things that the connector makes possible. This is for patrons to be able to log in directly, place requests. And then for those requests to go through a period of staff mediation where um, they show up on your uh, request list and your outgoing request list and full, until the staff member says, no, that's okay. That request can go out. So if you tend to have a lot of patrons who request things um, that you own and, and you like depending on local policy, like I know in Maryland, we were supposed to fill um, holds at least 10 years ago, they've changed now, but you're supposed to fill holds with your local copies, especially for new stuff and not like, you know, go, try to get um, other people's copies on ILL if you had a shelf copy um, available but checked out. So you can do that if you don't want to send something out on ILL. Um, 20 targets. So if a uh, request is sitting there and it's bounced around a bunch of libraries and somebody has retargeted or it has been automatically retargeted, that's now logged and you can see that. It was always logged, but it's now visible in the staff interface. You can say, okay, you know, why is this request taking so long to fill? Oh, it's been kicked around like seven places or, you know, th that would be useful for Evergreen too, just because it would be, um, you know, so you can go like, you know, um, 2021, of course, also saw the Evergreen ILS Connector 2022 uh, was our initial work on the Sierra ILS Connector. Sierra! And um, then 2023 was the Koha ILS Connector. So a few factors, obviously, right now we're uh, prioritizing Connecticut libraries, um, but if anybody is interested in talking about other connector development, um, you know, we're happy to talk to you about that, particularly if um, you can put us in touch with the right people at that proprietary vendor to make this easier. Um, another thing I mentioned earlier is, earlier is non-returnables and digital delivery um, is something else you're looking at. Um, upstreaming requests, which is where if you have a two-tiered ILL system that you participate with, so maybe one of your systems is local, um, you know, for like to OCLC to like a national um, ILL system. So upstreaming those requests seamlessly, like so taking them from fulfillment. And if it goes through fulfillment, doesn't find anything, you know, having those automatically upstreams to a, a bigger provider um, is also on our list. Um, Two-way communication, like Jessica mentioned, primarily now the workflow is fulfillment driven. So you're doing all of your those fulfillment can read information, like information about, um, you know, uh, patron status and authentication, item status at time of request and things like that. Um, but ideally, you know, we could get that to really be a more be true two-way uh, communication. So if ILS can then update fulfillment. Um, upgraded management interfaces. Um, so Mike mentioned that those staff management interfaces are in AngularJS. Uh, We'd love to see those be in Angular. And really whatever um, you would like to see, you know, please reach out. We'd be happy to talk as always about custom developments. 
right. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what our future plans are based on existing evergreen features that we can leverage in the fulfillment system. Um, so as available to us, and um, we happen to have a statewide delivery service that, um, you know, it has hubs and routes and things of that nature. And we've already implemented proximity adjustment in our evergreen system that to look at those deliberate routes and prioritize the filling of holds based on those locations. So this is something that we're going to be looking at doing in, in fulfillment as well. Um, we're also going to be looking at implementing age-based hold protection for any library who's interested in that. Um, and uh, we'll also be working out, uh, we're, Rogan and I have been going back and forth on some enhancements for the auto-loading screen, things a little bit easier for everybody. So we're, we'll be working on uh, rolling out those enhancements. And um, we plan to revisit patron-initiated holds. Again, this is something that got COVIDed. <laughs> uh, so uh, we, we need to go back and figure out um, how to roll that out and um, you know if there's anything additional uh, and I do want to, I didn't put a slide in here for this, but I do want to say like on behalf of Connecticut, um, if you happen to have your state library's ear or anything like that, we would love to have you join us uh, because we know that open source works best, right? Um, but, you know, our, our, our director was visionary, our state librarian was visionary, was visionary in, um, you know, getting on top of this project in, in its early days. Um, and now it's mature <laughs> and you can come and reap the benefits of what we've developed and help us develop it more because we can't do it. And we don't have much in the way of time left, but if you have any questions, comments, things you want to share about your own ILL, the floor is open. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's what Jessica was just talking. Oh, sorry. So the question was, is there a way in fulfillment to set, um, you know, stop like newer items from, from being circulated in fulfillment? And the answer is yes, um, which stock, it has the same three months, six month uh, options like Ever stock evergreen has, but you know, you can make those whatever you need them to be. And you can also set it um, based on shelving, like just like in every in certain shelving locations, you know, you can tell, say that that is not a holdable location and then it'll still be visible, you know, searchable within the, the union catalog, but not requestable via fulfillment. So yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Can autographics and fulfillment talk to each other? Not like seamlessly right now, but there are standards um, that can be leveraged to make them talk to each other. With development. With development, all things are possible, which is the gospel according to Mike Graylander. So um, I'm sorry for the blasphemy. If, uh, you could, yeah. Um, you know that we we would. It's probably observation that autographics can um, send out to fulfillment, and then you know bring that information in and making it a fulfillment request, or the other way around. So if you guys you know wanted to participate, if that consortium wanted to participate, you know via autographics, um, that data could probably be magic in there, right? Yeah, autographics has several ways to send and receive XML data about holdings. So, uh, uh, so development, development, development. <laughs> Uh, how much development we'd have to investigate first. But, yeah. Follow up question that there's a, as I said in the beginning, there's actually a quite a large uh, autographic ILS presence of your own system as well if that connector gets developed in the future. It's something we would want to get information from autographics yeah. on and see the specs from them about what they can share on the technical side. And but how close definitely maybe. <laughs> that is good. <laughs> Yeah, but now I want to see the timeline if they still are interfaces. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think that means we need to update the update those interfaces then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it the, there hopeless holds is since it's part of Evergreen is available in fulfillment. It's available on the admin side. Um, it's not currently exposed in the general staff side, but you know, like Jessica could. Um, and, you know, there's no reason that couldn't be with fairly small development exposed to the uh, fulfillment staff interface side as well. But that base functionality is there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sorry, the question was about hopeless holds. <laughs> Anything else in our last uh, 30 to 60 seconds here? No. Everyone looks very tired. I'm, I'm sympathetic. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time.